hoping that uh, it will be a saving grace nonetheless. Okay? So what I thought I would do is I, I would give you a little, a little basic summary about the characters. You have Jasper, who's an accountant, who uh, is full of interesting ideas about how to kind of further artistic and, and other kinds of things. Gary, who's an, who's an accountant friend of his, who gets involved with Jasper uh, in theatrical excursions. Jennifer, Miranda, and the book opens with uh, the setting on Central Park West where Jennifer, Miranda, and Gary are, are trying to uh, coexist in a uh, kind of um, Nirvana-like way, uh, which of course runs into trouble. Uh, quickly. <laughs> so this, this, however, this new character was introduced into the into the story, aside from Gary's father, who's a lawyer, and Gary's mother, and the other stuff, and Jean Viev, who was involved in the first book. And the new character is someone I'll introduce, and I'll read these two chapters, uh, which introduces her, and which will give you a flavor of of what the book is about and how it's written. And and I will say also about the writing, um, it's. You know, it, it's kind of a, they're, I like to call these riffs. They're riffs, they're and elements of stand-up, they're puns, they're all kinds of crazy things, and the language itself. And the language is what always attracted me to P.G. Woodhouse. He's a really clever uh, user of the actual language. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to uh, um, entice you with my peculiar new or novel kind of approach to these goofy scenarios. And with that, I'll begin. <clears throat> One other thing about the run is that the acoustics are really great, so it's so nice to be able to read very naturally without having to overextend oneself and whatnot. If you can't hear me, just raise your hand, and I'll make sure that I'll break a little bit more. Okay? This is from, I'll read chapters five and six, but the middle of the book, and this is entitled, No String Theories Attached. For ordinary couples, the playing field is pretty simple and the outcome quite predictable. You were either on or off, and 50% of the time you'd be off for good. The other 50% you'd be on with a lot of downtime off. <laughs> but for Jennifer, Miranda, and me, there were shifting alliances in constant flux. Three sets of couples embedded in a trinity, holy or unholy, depending on your open-mindedness. It turned out that Jennifer's re-entry into the Eden she vacated for the faux musketeer Gerhard and his theatrical faux pas de deux was harder for Miranda than me. And this relates to a chapter where Jennifer took a bit of a sabbatical from, uh, uh, from Shangri-La. That line about the woman scorned, which my mother assured me Shakespeare had nothing to do with, and I tended to trust her in these kinds of things, was right on target. Except whoever wrote it missed the bit about the fury being a hell of a lot worse for the woman scorned by another woman. Whenever I came to Jennifer's defense, Miranda accused me of being an arbitrageur, whatever that was, but it had a mercenary ring, and she knew it. And when I tried to explain to Jennifer that Miranda's position could be understood, I got the commie sympathizer sobriquet, which Jennifer knew was unfair, because Miranda was more Bakunin than Marx, not that I could tease out the finer points. So I was the middleman, in bed and out. Luckily, my unlikely show of force on the off-Broadway stage had earned me some esteem, so that eventually I brought the warring quarks together long enough to lay their charges on the table. I don't care about your thing with that thing who directed you, protested Miranda, but how could you waste your talent on such absolute tripe? I myself had given lots more weight to the thing rather than the tripe part of the equation, but I let it slide. Jennifer blushed but tried to explain herself. Look, I wanted to prove something. I wanted to see if I still had it, and getting the part with so much competition was... And here she kind of drifted off and looked a little funny. <laughs> and did you get the part on dramatic talent alone, Jen? Asked Miranda <laughs> in a kind of still, small voice. 
Jennifer's blushes turned to tears despite her best efforts, and Miranda relented at the sight, and the girls finally kissed and made up and are now kissing again just like old times, only better. And with Shangri-La going full steam ahead on an even keel, I can breathe sighs that are equal parts relief and joy. But I had my worries, especially about girls with personalities like Miranda and Jennifer, personalities I tended to associate with cheetahs and tigers who could have their way with almost anything they put their minds, hearts, and bodies to. I didn't mind being mincemeat, but when I thought of all the other bodies floating on the island of Manhattan and Burroughs, the possibilities for trouble in paradise were too much to bear, and too many to, to count. So I counted my blessings instead. Jennifer, Miranda, me? You're a blessing in disguise, said Jasper, as we slummed it at a bar in Queen, Queens, close to his matrimonial nest. I needed a bit of encouragement, because with cannon to the right and cannon to the left, I had begun to doubt my own ability to hold the fort. Your weakness is your strength, Gary. Believe me, life with Amelia would be a lot easier if I were as boring as you. <laughs> I hadn't expected this kind of slap on the back. Boring is the glue that keeps those two feisty birds spinning around. Boring is good, Gary, at least for this phase. But the strategy has to shift. Don't worry, you've got a few months grace period. And then what? By the way, am I really that boring? Do you want an honest answer? No. Good. Jasper, in addition to his experience as poet, entrepreneur, impresario, PR man, aspiring anarchist, and a veteran of marriage with two divorces under his belt, was now testing the waters for his newest venture in online relationship counseling. <laughs> Honesty. The upshot was that he was keen to dole out the honest advice in bucketfuls, or should I say buckets full? Never mind. Let me give you some advice. Be yourself. To tell you the absolutely unvarnished, uncoded, simple truth, Gary, you're your own worst enemy. But I thought you said I was a blessing, I replied. <laughs> a blessing in disguise. So how am I the enemy? Because of the disguise. What disguise? What are you talking about? Calm down. The bartender's given us the eye. Lucky for you, I've got a solution. You know a little about Plato, don't you? Not the cave again. What cave? Forget it. What about Plato? The key to every successful relationship is to have something on the side. I thought that's how they fell apart. You've got a one-track mind, Gary. I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about something on the outside of the inside of your relationship with the girls. Something that will make you feel better about yourself and, and this is the beauty of it, that will make you look a whole lot more interesting to them. It's about the psychology of women, Gary. And believe me, as a gay man, I've come to appreciate their depths like never before. That's where Plato comes in. And, be, and actually, because you're my friend, that's where I come in too. The hairs on the back of my neck started to do a strange little dance, and I cleared my throat a few times while eyeballing the exit. I wasn't ready for this, and I said it. <laughs> Jasper, I'm not built that way. What way? You know. No, I don't know. What are you talking about? I'm not a southpaw. What? I'm not a switch hitter either. Jasper stared at me and shook his head. You're not a genius, that's for sure. <laughs> what I'm talking about, Gary, is the platonic relationship and how, with my help, you'll take that damned Atlantis of yours to another orbit. Whew. Then Japs Jasper mapped out the strategy. I have to give the guy credit. He was never at a loss for crazy ideas, but at least this crazy idea wasn't fraught like virtually all of his other crazy ideas. Complicated, perhaps. Fraught, no. At least I didn't think so. At the worst, I'd be out a few bucks on reading materials and a few hours of my time meeting my new platonic friend. So why not give it a try? 
That's the spirit, Gary, exclaimed Jasper. It's a risk-free trial with a double-your-money-back guarantee, and you don't have to spend a cent. All I want in return, when you've raked in the chips, is a little quote from my website. Have we got a deal? Okay, buddy, I replied, shaking his hand and thinking that two times nothing was nothing, but never mind. It wasn't about the money anyway. At first, I had second thoughts about the whole thing, because... Jennifer and Miranda couldn't have been more alluring and indulging, and they couldn't have been more themselves. A weak reader might have supposed that I'd given their differences short shrift because I'd been focusing on their shared delights, but a strong one would have detected my fine appreciation. Jennifer was all tall, curvaceous, bright blue-eyed effervescence with drama oozing out of her pores, while Miranda was sleek, sinuous, and sultry, and could play the violin like an angel when she wasn't burning one. Jennifer had a talent for making money hand over fist without blinking an eye, and Miranda had a talent for figuring out ways to distribute it for the yearning masses equitably. Together they were now pooling their resources for a YouTube video depicting the anarcho-socialist ideal realized in a fictional family of three pioneers. A sneak preview of the provisional script confirmed my worries. The fictional accountant in the fictional family was nothing more than a straight man. So I set to work. Phase one was easy enough. I carted a few non-e-books home and left them lying around the environs, books for the layman on quantum physics, quantum electrodynamics, and even something called quantum chromodynamics. Loosely speaking, they all had something to do with numbers. Then came the tomes on supersymmetry, the multiverse, and best of all, a theory about strings that explained everything and was free of any of that bothersome scientific need for factual verification, <laughs> because nothing about it could be experimentally verified. I can't say I actually learned much about anything except that being a physicist, astrophysicist, or a cosmologist must not be a terribly fulfilling career or didn't take up much time because virtually every one of them was hard at work writing bestsellers that purported to educate the great unwashed about things that can only be understood by a few dozen people in the world. However, meeting Helena was another thing altogether. This is where my genius comes in, Gary, if I may say so myself. Good thing. I'd never have associated genius with the man. Chutzpah, yes. Genius, no. Anyway, Jasper's so-called genius came in with his personal selection from a vast reservoir of connections in the gay and lesbian community of the perfect platonic companion for me, <laughs> Helena. Why is she perfect, I asked. You'll see, Gary replied. How's phase one coming along? The girls are impressed, I confessed. <laughs> what did I tell you? They're like open books. But I hope you realize how it hangs together. You see, Gary, you're a numbers guy. So the topic of interest has to be related, but it also has to be a stretch from counting bucks to counting stars. There's a kind of symmetry, isn't there? It's almost frightening when you think about it. Stretch or no stretch, it was working like a dream. The girls were all over me for my newfound interests, and the questions couldn't come fast enough. Luckily for me, they were as stymied by the higher languages of math and physics as I, but they liked the layman's analogies, the big bang like a big balloon, wiggling superstrings that worm their way through extra dimensions, and our multiverse like a loaf of sliced bread. And they gave me an impetus for refining the stuff with my new platonic friend-to-be. What's she like, Jasper? A particle astrophysicist, what can you expect? The kind who spend their lives learning more and more about less and less until they know virtually everything about nothing. Plus, she's as gay as they come. That's the beauty of the whole thing. That's what'll keep it honest. Good luck with phase two. By the time you get to phase three, you'll be kissing me in gratitude or trying to. Au revoir, mon ami. 
Helena had arrived punctually at a little bar near Washington Square where two people could actually converse without shouting. Jasper had been doing his homework. You're late, but that's okay, she said. And she was right. I was running about 30 seconds behind. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm Gary. I know. And you know I'm Helena. Right again. The scientific type. What would you like to drink? It's on me. Power trips? No thanks. Let's go Dutch. So we went Dutch, and after about an hour and three drinks on my part, I began to feel as if she didn't hate me personally, but merely all mankind. <laughs> the male part, that is, which was a start. I had come armed with my books, which she dismissed the way Rembrandt might have chuckled at a stick figure. Do you know what the M stands for in M theory? Mother? You men are all alike, always blaming your mothers. I have to admit, I was beginning to wonder how a platonic friendship could be forged on the basis of antagonism. But somehow or other, I slipped in something about my work, and when she heard IRS deductions, she lit up like a bonfire, and we snowballed down the rest of the evening until pretty late, so late, in fact, that I had to make sure Jasper could cover me. You see, part of phase two was that the meetings with the platonic friend were to be kept under wraps until the time was ripe to let the cat out of the bag. Again, a Jasper machination with Jasper as my alibi. Once the PF, or PR if you prefer, was in full swing, then I'd let the girls in on it. And that's where the psychological part would come in. According to Jasper, there would be retrospective jealousy. No risk jealousy that enhances your stature. You see, Gary, you've got to keep a woman, and in your case, two of them, on their toes. Let them become complacent, and you're lost, or you've lost them if you get my drift. So, retrospective jealousy, which I might patent it so damn good, <laughs> does two things. It reminds them that you are forced to be reckoned with, that you're not just a measly, boring accountant who's lucky to pick up the scraps they throw you. <laughs> but, and here's another genius part, because the outside thing is purely platonic, it doesn't push them over the edge and create rifts and hysteria and cast you adrift like that little bit you pulled with Svetlana. Complicated, I thought, but it made some kind of sense. And in truth, it felt nice to be valued for my work with numbers. And the fact that I could end up saving Helena quite a piece of change softened the anti-male attitude a bit, and we could go on talking about other things. I didn't need to cart the bestsellers around anymore because the other things didn't have anything to do with quasars or gravity waves. They were mostly about what we liked to eat and wear, the non-science books we read, her last 15 girlfriends, and the view from Central Park West. And I could tell her about Jennifer's quirks, the ones that drove me nuts but which I could never tell Miranda about, and vice versa, for the sake of preserving the good ship Shangri-La. Helena, particle astrophysicist or astroparticle physicist or not, understood. And then I understood what this whole platonic thing was really all about. I guess you could say we were becoming pretty good chums. She was a treasure trove of information on tips about the other half, as I was, I think, for mine, for her, never mind, you know what I mean. Because it was an exceptionally beautiful and cool spring, we tended to talk a lot about the weather and trees and flowers and the sky too, but in a Keats or Shelley rather than Hubble kind of way. <laughs> and we talked about the art we liked and the galleries in Soho that were becoming more and more pretentious and where to get the best hot dogs in New York. I nearly forgot what she looked like. I got so caught up in her personality. Nearly, but not quite. Because although she wasn't the head-turning type like the girls, there was an awful lot to appreciate. And I found myself musing frequently about her girlfriends that savored the goods. One Saturday afternoon, just as summer rolled in and right after we had seen the Vermeers and the cool of the Frick Museum, she pulled me up and said she'd wondered now for a long time how it would feel to kiss a man. I said, brushing her hair back gently, that she didn't need to wonder anymore. And when she told me I kissed like the most wonderful woman, I didn't mind at all. <laughs> 
Now, one doesn't have to be a scientist to be able to make discoveries. And I discovered long ago that kisses can not only be contagious, but that they tend to migrate pretty freely and multiply under the right conditions. <laughs> At Helena's digs near Columbia, they migrated and multiplied like an avalanche. On the way home, I was tempted to blame it all, not on the stars, but on dark energy, which makes up 95% of the known, unknown, uni multiverse, according to what I'd read. But I didn't. And I was also tempted to blame it all on Jasper. <clears throat> but there, too, I demurred, because there wasn't anyone or anything to blame. It was just too beautiful, even if I'd stepped into a wormhole with no way out. I was late. The girls greeted me with a question mark and suggested that we cluster around the campfire for a powwow. I hemmed and hawed and noticed as we all sat down that they were holding hands. And just as I was about to open my mouth, Jennifer put her fingers to her lips. Don't say a word, Jennifer said. Jasper filled us in. My eyes widened the way eyes might widen when they see a tiger or a cheetah or both coming straight at them in full stride, and my mouth was open too, soundlessly. I blushed. While you were exploring the universe, Jennifer and I were learning a little more about each other, said Miranda, stroking Jennifer's cheek. Why don't we share our findings, whispered Jennifer, as they took me by the hand. And let's not worry about proving anything, added Miranda. Jasper. I rasped. Hey, Gary, look before you. Jasper, I interrupted. You're a son of a bitch. Gary, listen to me. I can explain it all. I dare you. The idea was that they should know what you thought they didn't know. Because it was platonic, they had nothing to worry about. And that they would think you were being devious but idealistic at the same time. The perfect combination. Is that all you can say? Well, yeah, I guess. What else can I say? And you? Go ahead. Say your piece. I can take it. I'm sorry. Don't be. What? I owe you thanks. You what? You heard me. Thanks. It all worked out despite your goofball plans and strategies. But how? Honesty. Come on, don't kid me. I'm not. Honest. But one more thing, my friend. Whatever you want, Gary. If there's anything I can do, tell me. I want my money back. <laughs> and I've never heard him laugh so hard before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'll read now from the next chapter. Any questions, any comments? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay, this chapter, chapter six, <clears throat> It's complicated. Now, I'll describe Bernie as Jasper's Gary's uh, boss at the accounting firm. Okay, so I'll introduce him. He, and he also figures into the book in the previous book. This time, Bernie only had to look at me, and I knew he wanted a word. Well, more than one. So I followed him into his office happily. Actually, I did most everything happily these days. And as I sat down, Bernie smirked and settled his bulk into the big chair for the tete-a-tete. -tete. Gary, he wheezed, possibly from his cigar habit, wipe that goddamn grin off your face. Oh, sorry, Bernie, but it was hard. Ever since my platonic relationship or friendship with Helena, I couldn't stop smiling. You look like you've got stars in your eyes, for Christ's sake. Well, I felt like I had stars on my brain, at least. I'd never seen so many stars before, night or day, and all because of Plato and Jasper and this wonderful new expanding universe, thanks to Helena. Bernie continued, You know, Gary, you've been running around the office like Patch Adams. <laughs> Smiling isn't good for the workplace. We're numbers people. We need serious. One misplaced decimal point, and then we've got the IRS breathing down our clients' necks, and then our clients breathing down our necks. They don't pay us the big bucks to run a circus act. We've got to look the part, kid. Sorry, Bernie, I hope it hasn't affected my work. Who said anything about your work? That's not the issue. Your work's perfect. 
even more perfect than usual. It's all this smiling and cheer. I know you've got a good setup over there in Strawberry Fields, but sometimes too much can be too much. Then he pinched my cheek and smiled. He couldn't help himself, I guess, and said, you're a lucky son of a gun. And that Miranda, he checked himself abruptly, however, possibly because he recalled the night we shared a Romeo e Giulietta and another unnamed hand-rolled item at my place while Jennifer was experimenting with another musketeer. <laughs> Listen, kid, I wouldn't have mentioned anything if you weren't down to skin and bones. True, I had lost a few pounds, but that was only because I didn't have much appetite for anything except my platonic astroparticle physicist friend, Helena. And forget about the coffee. Let's get right down to the cigars. Tomorrow night. I've still got a few from your stash, and it'll give me an excuse not to hear another damn string quartet with Gertrude. Just before we left his corner office with floor-to-ceiling glass and a view of most of the rooftops of the lower part of Manhattan, he paused. Hey, maybe you can do me a favor and save me an argument with the wife. See if you're, see if Miranda might be interested in the concert. I forget which quartet is playing. They will look and sound alike to me, but they're a big deal. At least Gertrude can't stop talking about them, whoever they are. And Miranda plays the violin, right? Yeah, like an angel, I bet. And she could talk shop with Gertrude and Gertrude would eat it up, believe me. Give her a call and tell her Uncle Bernie has a seat for her front and center. I'd get one for your other, uh, for Jennifer too, but the damn thing is sold out and I hear that even the scalpers are dry. <clears throat> sure thing, Bernie, I'll give her a call. And Jennifer won't mind, don't worry. She can use a little downtime to herself. There's nothing down about that chick, Gary, you lucky goddamn devil. Then he winked, pinched the cheek again, grabbed my neck, and finally slapped me on the back, propelling me to my cubicle. And I was smiling again. Under ordinary circumstances, say in the ordinary world or universe, a guy like me might be expected to be fending off slings and arrows and bearing fardels and whatnot out of agonbite of inwit and such like. But because I was fortunate enough to be a denizen of Shangri-La, I could get off scot-free. Besides, as Helena explained it while we strolled on the east side of Central Park, it all boiled down to dice. Think of it this way, darling, she urged. Einstein was wrong about one thing. The universe is a crapshoot. Anything can happen, like you and me. And after our kiss, a kiss during which I saw stars when I closed my eyes, and while they were open too, in hers, I might add, I added, I'm beginning to believe it. It's not about belief, Gary, it's science. We were about to continue our investigations into the science of osculation when a guy in a monstrous Harley Davidson pulled right up onto the sidewalk and revved the engine and stared at Helena. I was about to sidle in front of my platonic friend, but she brushed me back. I'll handle this, stay put. Next thing I know, the guy took off his helmet and turned out to be a girl with several pieces of metal dangling from various appendages and a sneer on two of them, too. Whatever Helena said, it worked because the girl was heading east on 76th Street like a warlock. Who was that, I inquired. Marissa. Oh, your ex, I guess. One of them, a few rungs down. I see. I really didn't see, but I said it anyway while thanking my lucky stars that in a dicey universe, big changes could occur in a relatively short space of time. It wasn't long ago that Helena, advertised by Jasper as more lesbian than Sappho, couldn't look a man in the eye without spitting at him. And now, she couldn't seem to look at me without salivating. And the thing is, Miranda and Jennifer were actually encouraging when I emphasized the platonic nature of the association, which is how Jasper built it when he spilled the beans on me. It's amazing what a word can do. Over several brandies and the Cohiba Genios I had treated Bernie to after he rescued me from a theatrical encounter with the NYPD on Jennifer's opening and closing night off-Broadway, I garbled out the gist, smiling. But Bernie frowned. Gary, listen to me. A leopard doesn't change its spots, at least not overnight. It's been several weeks, Bernie. 
You know what I mean. But what about the nymphs? What about them? Stop smiling, for Christ's sake. It's unnerving. <laughs> Bernie, I can't help it. She makes me happy. Happy? You look like a skeleton. Is that happy? <laughs> You've got it made with Miranda and Jennifer. Do you know how lucky you are? I feel like the luckiest guy in the world, Bernie. And I went on to tell him about how important she made my numbers, our numbers, I corrected, seem because she, of how she used them in her incredible calculations and how I felt like part of the center of the atoms at the center of the stars with her. Bernie simply puffed away, and I went on like this until the Grand Havana kicked us out. As we waited for a cab, he put his arm around my shoulders and shook his head. Whatever you do, kid, don't do anything rash. Like what, Bernie? Like get married, okay? Which was really, really strange, because that's exactly what I had been thinking of doing. <laughs> and eat something, Bernie shouted, speeding away. If I hadn't been so happy, I guess I would have felt a little crestfallen. Bernie, of all people, unlike my parents, or Miranda's parents, or any parents I could think of, would have wanted me to be happy. Anyway, when I got home that night, the girls were already asleep, and I just gazed through our window up at the stars, the same stars Helena used every bit of her fabulous brain power to study happily. As I said before, Helena wasn't the head-turning type like Jennifer or Miranda, two women who could cause whiplash at a hundred paces, <laughs> but she had depths, deep ones, and a temper too, as I discovered, when I made an innocent joke about something called supersymmetry, which she took the wrong way because her left eye was a bit higher than her right, and well, I thought it was funny at the time, but she decided that hurling pasta at my head was the more appropriate response. I wasn't hungry anyway. <laughs> it took me all night to convince her that I meant what I was trying to say as a compliment, and in the end, it was worth it. That's when she brought up that bit about binary stars. Two stars bound together, Gary, forever, circling each other and held by an inconceivably powerful force. Like our kisses, I sighed. Almost as strong, she replied. We made the decision on the spot, and to celebrate, she decided to put on a little makeup, something in her former life she told me she absolutely despised, but now... And she put some on me, too, which had a certain effect, and it would have been the most perfect night if her buzzer hadn't gone off a million times, and she eventually had to answer it and to let another of her exes in to collect her stuff. This one was brawnier than the motorcyclist, and she overstayed her welcome by about two hours. <laughs> two hours during which she cried, threatened, stormed, and sneered at Helena, but didn't deign to nod or glance at me. When she finally slammed the door on her way out with her two CDs, <laughs> it took a while for the bliss to build up again, but Helena and I managed. <laughs> and afterwards, <laughs> Just as I was about to leave to avoid a curfew violation at Shangri-La, she put her arms around me at the door. Do you know what we're made of, darling? Atoms and molecules, I replied, having picked up a little on the scientific view of things. Stardust. I stayed the night. Because I couldn't come up with any plausible excuse, I was forced to tell Miranda and Jennifer the truth, mostly that I had gotten so caught up in learning about the heavens and the Planck unit and quantum gravitational rainbows that it was dawn before I knew it. <laughs> the least you can do, spat Jennifer, is introduce her to us. Lucky for you she's gay and this is all platonic, <laughs> and that my gay ex can back this up. She was, of course, referring to Jasper, who had the presence of mind to cover for me, but who demanded to know what was happening. So I told him. Jasper, I said, I'm not going to blame you because it's not your fault. In fact, I should really give you a hug, but I won't. I just want to thank you, my friend. I've been hit by the most wonderful thunderbolt in the world. I'm sure Genevieve has a French way of saying it, but there it is. Gary, are you sure? I've never been more sure of anything in my life. More sure than numbers? He asked slyly, giving me pause. <laughs> yeah, I answered after a while. More sure than black and white.
damn, you sure you're not just seeing stars? Jasper, I'm sure I am seeing stars and I can't get enough of them. This was supposed to be platonic. It is, that's exactly what it is. It's been, I've been one of those guys in Plato's cave who's finally seen the light and all thanks to you. Geez, Gary, leave me out of this part of the equation, please. And do me a favor, will you? No, two of them. Cut down on the smiling and start eating something. <laughs> the only snag now was whether to break the news to the girls before or after we got married. Here's where Bernie threw his considerable weight around when I broke the news to him. Get over here, he commanded. Sit down and listen to me and God damn it, wipe that silly smile off your face. I did my best. Now look, Gary, I can tell you a little about marriage which was true, he was on his fourth. <laughs> it's not something you enter lightly. I was wondering how he entered his four marriages, but I didn't articulate it aloud. <laughs> it's a commitment, kid. There are certain things you should be sure about. I'm sure, Bernie, believe me. But are you sure of her, he replied, as sure as anything in the universe or multiverse. What the hell are you talking about? What's a multiverse? It's complicated, Bernie. Marriage shouldn't be a crapshoot, kid. But everything is, Bernie, except, I added, Helen and I aren't throwing dice. We're going binary, that's all. Like, like two pulsars. You lose any more weight, you won't have a pulse to speak of. <laughs> By the way, Gertrude's a different woman these days, smiling almost as bad as you. That's what music can do, I guess. She can't wait for the next quartet, and she can't get over Miranda. <laughs> I owe her big time for taking the heat off me. Out of courtesy, I heard him out, and I promised him because, let's face it, he's been good to me, that I would hold off anything formal until after I'd fronted up like a man to the girls. Now it was Bernie smiling, and soon he was advising me on just how the right thing could be done. They, Bernie said, referring to Miranda and Jennifer, still think it's platonic, right? I think so. And she, he added, referring to Helena, still thinks she's not gay or lesbian or whatever they call it, correct? She's in the American League now, right? Definitely. And you, you think the numbers add up? I do. Good. Now listen to me. Meeting my flatmates, I hadn't gotten too deeply into the particulars of Shangri-La with Helena wasn't at the top of my as yet unannounced fiancé's list of priorities, but she eventually agreed, although to look at her you'd think it was a day at the astroparticle physics lab. <laughs> Jeans, t-shirt, no makeup. Not that she looked bad at all, she just didn't like dressing up or didn't feel as if it was an occasion. Jennifer and Miranda, on the other hand, were dressed to kill, and I was on the brink of wavering a bit as I poured the wine for us as we sat around. <laughs> Dinner was a little while off. Miranda, who sported a pair of ankle boots as supple as a gray snow and a skirt as short as legally permissible in the state of New York, took the first stab at the iceberg between us. Gary says you're a stargazer and that you know all about fundamental forces and things in the universe. Or is it a multiverse? <laughs> Maybe you can tell us a little about your work. Hey, you know, answered Helena, I think it's really way over your heads. You wouldn't understand it. <laughs> Jennifer, who incidentally could have passed for a Parisian supermodel having a very good day on the catwalk, <laughs> bristled a bit, but responded with a lot less acid than I anticipated. Oh, come on, try. Being beautiful doesn't mean that we're dumb. And being smart doesn't mean that I'm not beautiful, Helen responded, a little testily, I noted, before continuing. In fact, do you know what it's like to be smart, to be so much smarter than everyone around you ever and everywhere all through your life? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Gary, said Miranda, do you think Helena is being a bit presumptuous? <laughs> I didn't know what to say, so I said it. Nothing. Because Helena didn't miss a beat. Presumptuous. I'd call it scientific. Well, said Jennifer, I suppose you wouldn't know what a burden it is to be gorgeous, would you? because being gorgeous means you never know why someone's interested in you. You're never, you're never sure if it's your talent or just your looks, or more accurately, more scientifically, I should say, our looks. Sweetie, said Helena, if all you have going for you is skin deep, 
you should make the most of it. But I've had an actual brain to take care of. And we're just brainless idiots, chimed in Miranda. Isn't that right, Gary? Especially brainless to think for one minute that you may have had anything more than a platonic whatever with this friend of yours. Now, a surprising thing happened. <laughs> Helena had spoken to me in an unguarded moment about something called quantum fluctuations, which I understood to be random, unpredictable leaps of one kind or another that could set off a whole new train of universes. By the standards of conventional human interaction, things were really not going so well. In fact, they were going so badly that <laughs> nothing less than a conflagration was in the offing, like the kind that erupted when Miranda set fire to her violin to protest Jasper's interruption of her Caliban-like wail during a dinner, I might add. Well, I guess a fire did arise, but not the expected kind, at least not the kind I would have expected. Helena rose and very gingerly placed her wine glass on the table and walked over to the other side of our lounge where Jennifer and Miranda were showing off their legs to great advantage. It was touch and go. Helena, I noticed, despite the casual garb meant to emphasize sang Freud, had been uncommonly restless all evening. She looked at Miranda, and then at Jennifer, and then back at Miranda again, kind of like a photon that couldn't quite decide if it was a wave or a particle. She didn't pounce at the speed of light because that would have been scientifically impossible. It just seemed that way. And Jennifer just as speedily kissed her back with an energy that was downright binary until she flung her over to Miranda's orb so she could kiss me in turn. And then it was back and forth until the free-for-all went on for all night long. <laughs> we had the untouched dinner for breakfast and I polished off what would have been the leftovers with an appetite that had suddenly reappeared. As we sipped our coffees, Jennifer casually asked about the wedding. I dropped my cup, fortunately empty. We're not so dumb after all, she said. Are we, Miranda? What do you think, Helena? asked Miranda. I think, said Helena, a bit sheepish and choosing her words carefully, that binary systems aren't the only viable ones. In fact, there's a four-star system right in the handle of the Big Dipper. And if it's clear tonight, I hope we can all take a look together. <laughs> Bernie, I croaked early Monday morning. The wedding's off. You don't say, he said, nonplussed. Yes, I mean, no, I mean, the girls knew all along about me and Helena. No kidding. Do you think they were dumb? <laughs> no, of course not. But I thought they thought it was platonic. Guess what, kid? Platonic is never platonic. Everybody knows that. But why did they let it ride? Two reasons. One, because they could see you were hopeless. Everybody could see you were hopeless. Two, because they thought enough of you to want to do the right thing. Don't make me get sentimental. Get out of here. But before you go, let me ask you something. Did that fruitcake have anything to do with this? Who? Cut it out. You know who. It's complicated, Bernie. You can say that again, he chuckled. <laughs> Thanks very much for indulging me.